Turkestan. Um, instead of west, you have east, uh, because it's a perspective from many Turkic peoples who lived in Central Asia, and sometimes as far west as Turkey. Uh, when I was in Istanbul in 2008, I met with uh, people who were a part of the East Turkestan Refugee Association. That's what they referred to it, and if I talked to them about Xinjiang, they probably would have become very upset. Uh, so the name itself already reveals um, a lot about um, its place in modern Chinese history. How do you translate Xinjiang? Well, it just means new territories, okay? Um, its latest incorporation into the modern Chinese state took place in the 1750s, relatively recently when you think of, you know, the long sweep of uh, Chinese history. Um, and it got its name, its uh, modern name of Xinjiang from the Chinese perspective um, in the 1750s. And it was finally made a province in 1884. Uh, now first I want to give you a little bit of a sense of where this region is in China. Okay, you can see on the inset map, it's in the far northwest, just above Tibet. Um, and uh, you know, oftentimes China is described, uh, it, it's a form as sort of a rooster. Okay, um, and you can see on the top on the rooster's back between its tail and its head, um, that's where uh, what was once referred to as Outer Mongolia used to be. And we'll have occasion in a minute to talk about why that is a white blank space on maps of China today. Um, now, this is the farthest northwestern region of the Chinese state today. Um, it is more largely a Muslim region. Uh, if you want to think about population percentages, prior to the 1950s, when really everything started to change, prior to the 1950s, you're looking at a demographic of about 70% of the population would have been sedentary agricultural farmers um, that today are known as Uyghurs. But back then, uh, prior to the 1920s, they were referred to by Chinese officials with what is now regarded as a derogatory term, uh, chanto, uh, chanhui, uh, turban heads, literally just based on how many men would wear turbans on their heads. That was the actual name that was used to describe them. Now, the Uyghurs are largely situated in the south. This is the Taklamakan Desert, and I don't have all the cities listed here, but they're sort of go in a circle. Uh, these are all oases. It's a massive desert. Um, and you have these string of oases that are sort of like a pearl necklace going around the Taklamakan Desert. Um, and these oases are some of the most isolated places in the entire world. Um, when I was there, I traveled the, throughout the province in 2007, and I wanted to make sure I saw each one of these oases down in the south. And you gotta take a bus from one to the next, and that bus ride is about eight hours long from one oasis to the next. And in between, it was like no, it wasn't some pretty beautiful desert, like the, like the deserts I had seen in picture books and calendars and whatnot. It looked like a moonscape uh, to me. It was a very desolate region. And then lo and behold, eight hours later on a rickety bus, you have a river coming down from the Tibetan Kunlun Mountains, and there is a beautiful uh, oasis inhabited largely by people now known as Uyghurs. Um, now, the other major population group is in the north. All right, you have the province by, uh, uh, um, divided in the middle by the Tian Shan Mountains, the Heavenly Mountains, and the north are mostly Kazakhs, or at least they were back in the day. Um, Kazakhs of Kazakhstan. Uh, 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 that's what most people think of today. Maybe about 15% of the population uh, were nomadic Kazakhs. They were not farmers. All right, so it's horseback. Think of Mongols, uh, Manchus, and whatnot. And they were in the north, a uh, much smaller percentage of the population. The Han? Prior to the 1950s, they were really just the ruling class. 5% um, of the population, definitely no more than 10% of the population. And they were fairly isolated in their government offices as well. And then you have a smattering of other ethnicities, Kyrgyz, Tajiks, uh, Solon, Manchu, um, other peoples. Uh, Xinjiang uh, today comprises one sixth of the territory of the People's Republic um, of China. Now, I want to say a little bit about how I got interested in Xinjiang, because when I first was interested in China, I had no interest in Xinjiang, I'd never even heard of it before. Um, I was fascinated uh, as a teenager by the difference that I saw in what we usually think of as China, which now, as a scholar historian, I have to distinguish between inner China and, and the non-Han peripheries. Uh, but back then, it was just China, like you think of uh, you know, the, the Han people in the heartland. All right. Um, I first got interested in China through Nintendo. Um, it was a video game. And I was 14 years old, it was my birthday, and I, my parents knew that I really liked war games, where you sort of use role-playing games, where you, uh, you're, you're a warlord, you farm, you collect money, um, you raise an army, and then you try to beat other warlords on the field of battle, and unite China. 
It was called Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Oh, yeah. Okay? And I loved it. I must have conquered China 150 times in the course of two years. And when I finished it, I thought, this experience is so awesome. I want to continue this. How do I, exper how do I continue this experience of this game? It was the game. Um, and I looked at the instruction book, and it said this is based on a historical novel, a fictional novel. And now, most people, if you know anything about China, you know Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Sangho Yan Yi is one of the most famous of all historical novels um, mm -hmm. in Chinese literature. So I read that in English translation. And that sort of kick-started a low-level interest in all things Chinese. It was all very vague. Japan, Korea, China, they were all China to me when I was a teenager. I used to go down to the video factory down the street, and then I would just go to the foreign films section. Um, and anything that looked like it was a Chinese film, I would rent it, and that to me was China. Okay? It was the Han heartland. Okay? Um, the, the video game itself, the far, it only covered this area. This is all I ever saw of what China was. Okay? Uh, I watched all those Zhang Yibo, Chiang Kai Ge. My first boyhood crush was on the actress Gong Li. Okay? <laughs> familiar with these films Raise the Red Lantern, Pharaoh, My Concubine. They're, 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 they're fairly well known um, films. Um, now, that version of China was my difference, ethnic and cultural difference, which I compared suburban America, Bothell, that I was growing up in at that time period. And I thought it was just so interesting. You compare East and West, I was really comparing Bothell and what I thought was China. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, my China, that was the difference that I compared America against, was Han-defined China, the inner provinces. 9-11 um, is what changed everything. 21 years old, 9-11 uh, showed me that China had its own internal ethnic and cultural difference as well, that I was wholly unaware of. I was 21 years old in 2001. I had just come back from my first trip ever to China. I went to Xi'an, it's the heartland. Many famous capitals of dynasties in the past uh, all uh, had their capital in Xi'an. Um, and I had taught English in the countryside north of Xi'an for a month, and then I backpacked around for another month. Uh, I got back, one month later was 9-11. Okay. How did 9-11 change uh, things that I knew about China? Well, for the first time ever, I heard about these people called the Uyghurs. I had never heard of them before. Um, some of you, if you're more familiar with what happened, uh, Beijing saw a great opportunistic uh, 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 ploy in which they said, hey, the US has their war against terror. This is a great time to sort of say, we have our own terrorists as well. Um, and they said, these people advocating East Turkestan independence, those are China's terrorists. Um, and we also have a war on terror. Um, and scholars have been debating for the last 15 years to what extent they truly were terrorists, just like the Amer America said we have our terrorist problem as well, and to what extent it was just people discontent with the Chinese state and they were being suppressed under the guise of terrorism. That's not an issue I wanna go into here, but nonetheless, that was the first time that I had ever heard um, of the Uyghurs. I was studying Chinese. I had two years of Chinese across the street University of Washington under the exact team uh, uh, guidance of Bill Absher, um, and I thought, okay, um, it's time to study a different language. I felt reasonably comfortable with Chinese. The Uyghurs were in the news, and I began my MA at the Jackson School, um, and I thought, all right, I'm going to try another language, and in a wonderful, amazing coincidence, they had a visiting professor uh, from Xinjiang who taught Uyghur language um, at the university, so I started studying Uyghur. I wanted to de demystify Arabic. It was on the news all the time. I thought, I want to know what the Arabic alphabet is like. So I studied that. Uh, turned out, in my opinion, to be much harder um, than Chinese ever was. The grammar in Uyghur was extremely, extremely difficult. But I thought, this will, this will be useful. Um, at the time, I didn't think I was going to go and become a scholar and a historian and go into academia. I thought, I'm going to go into government. Um, and uh, I can say, hey, everyone else just knows Chinese, but I know Uyghur. And that now, these are terrorists, right? Uh, so you want to hire me. I was at the Jackson School, and I submitted applications to the State Department, NSA, FBI. FBI was actually looking for Uyghur specialists as well at that time period, um, and the CIA. Um, and it turned out uh, none of them were interested in me except for the CIA, and even they didn't want me for the job I had applied for. I applied for an analyst position, and they said, why don't you come and interview for the clandestine service? Uh, so I did that. And, uh, I was cautious but intrigued, so they flew me out to Washington, D.C. 
Um, and I think at some point when they gave me the paperwork where I said, you need to uh, be comfortable being posted in a part of the world without adequate medical facilities or access to your family for up to three years at a time, and be physically fit enough where you can uh, enter a training course to be able to get in and out of a moving vehicle at 30 miles per hour. <laughs> uh, and at that point, I started to realize this probably isn't where uh, my future lies. Um, I did not get the spy job. Uh, for <laughs> it's probably a good thing. And I thought, who wants to live in DC anyways? Who wants to be out there? And I thought, uh, you know, if I go into academia, that's another uh, uh, path for me. I'll have lots more options. I don't want to leave the best city in the world, Seattle. I can maybe stay on the East Coast. I go into academia, and I get sent to DC. Um, so, uh, can't fight change and use that to embrace it. Now, why Xinjiang? Okay, that put me on the path of grad school. Why did I want to? Uh, why did I want to study Xinjiang? China also has lots of Tibetans and lots of Mongols. If you're looking for ethnic and cultural difference, these populations are much w uh, better known as well. Um, the problem with Tibet and Mongolia, if you're studying 20th century Chinese history, is that both of them became estranged or separated from the 20th century Chinese states in one form or another for a large part of the 20th century. Um, Tibet, although today it's a part of the PRC, uh, originally uh, Tibet succeeded in eradicating all emissaries, all Han officials that were sent from inner China, the central government, from about the 19-teens until the 1950s, when the PLA, People's Liberation Army, finally sent an army in and reestablished central government control. Um, it was formally on paper a part of China, but de facto it was independent for about 40 years. Okay? Mongolia was lost entirely. They lost that during the Russian Civil War. Long, interesting story that we don't have time for here, but Mongolia was a part of the last Chinese empire, the Qing Dynasty, um, and they lost it in 1921. Maps published in Taiwan by the, uh, the nationalist government still claim Outer Mongolia is part of China, uh, but that's merely a, a fantasy on paper. Uh, it's no longer something that the mainland government even tries to acknowledge. So, only Xinjiang experienced what I would refer to as unbroken Chinese rule in the 20th century, ruled continuously by Han officials sent from the heartland. It's the only major region of ethnic and cultural difference separate from the Han, um, once you have an overwhelming majority of the population that's not Chinese, does not identify as Chinese, does not speak Chinese, and yet it's still a part of the Chinese state and emissaries sent from the central government continuously exercise rule and are never kicked out throughout the entirety of the 20th century. Wow. That, this is one of the first images from the book. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of my favorite photographs taken by the explorer Oral Stein. 1906, the man sitting down in very imperious demeanor um, <laughs> is Chi Yuhang, the magistrate of Khotan, uh, one of the major oases in the southwest part of the province. He has his opium pipe there. Uh, no. No uh, 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 you know, self-respecting Chinese official would be without their opium pipe um, in 1906. Um, and it, as you can see, only he is sitting. Behind him, maybe you can't tell, um, but uh, they're all Muslim, what we would now refer to as Uyghur, banks, local headmen, local power brokers who have come together and said, we'll work with the Chinese to help them stabilize their rule. Um, and the, 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 the ratio of one Han to all those Uyghurs in the background is a pretty good indication of what the demographic ratio was like all the way until the 1930s. <laughs> one Chinese official um, surrounded by Muslim Uyghurs or Kazakhs in the north who have chosen to work with the Chinese state. Well, maybe not chosen, but they see that as their best bet uh, for a livelihood and peace and stability in the region. Okay? Um, this image represents a very sharp break with the past. Okay? Prior to this generation of Han officials gaining power in Xinjiang, um, there had not been Han officials sent from the inner provinces in the Han heartland to what we think of, what we now know is, uh, what we now refer to as Xinjiang, in over a thousand years. The last time a Chinese dynasty, a Chinese state, centered, anchored in the heartland, Beijing, Nanjing, whatever it might be, um, had been able to send its own Han emissaries out to Xinjiang to rule on the ground as a high-level official was during the Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, And now, only since 1884, when the Qing Empire decided, we've got Russians over here, we have British in India, we need to exert more control on Xinjiang, they turned it into a province, just like any other province, just like Guangdong province, Jiangsu province, 
in the heartland. I said, all right, we're going to turn this into a province uh, so we can integrate it more. And after 1884, for the first time, you see Han officials from the heartland being sent out to Xinjiang to rule as governor and very high post. And Chu Yuhang, this guy sitting here, is one of the very first, um, uh, is part of the first generation of Han officials to be sent to Xinjiang. 